So the very last thing that we are going to talk about is the molecular mechanisms of learning and memory. This is just going to be kind of a brief overview because there's way more here than we could possibly cover in uh, even really one semester. But um, we're, we're going to be talking about memory, but really specifically procedural memory, meaning um, for, for humans, that means those types of memories that we really don't have uh, explicit awareness of. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the different types here. So roughly you can divide procedural learning or memory into two uh, types. So non-associative learning uh, includes things like habituation. Uh, this is probably the simplest form of, uh, of memory there is. It involves simply a reduced response to a repetitive stimulus. Um, so in other words, if you have a response to a stimulus, whatever whatever it is, so it could be um, to a painful stimulus or to, to a non-painful stimulus, um, and then the response to that stimulus reduces over time as you repeatedly are exposed to it, that's an example of habituation. And this is a, something that probably we experience all the time. So if you have uh, if there's an, uh, uh, an annoying sound in your room from a, uh, an alarm going off, uh, perhaps um, maybe the first time it goes off, you jump or you're startled by it. But if it goes off repeatedly um, uh, over you know several hours or days or whatever the time frame is, um, eventually you get to a point where you're no longer um, bothered by it. So that that would be an example of habituation. And then sensitization um, is kind of the opposite. It's uh, exaggerated responses to a stimulus um, that's caused by a, uh, a single or a, a small number of very strong stimuli. So uh, that can, can take a lot of forms. Um, let's say, again, you have a relatively mild but repetitive stimulus um, that uh, you're exposed to over and over again. Um, again, let's say um, a a sound like a you know a door opening. Um, but then uh, at some point, uh, while you're hearing that sound, some other very strong uh, stimulus occurs, and it can be you know something very frightening or painful, um, uh, or uh, otherwise just sort of emotionally resonant. Um, so you know, say someone screams uh, when the door opens one time. Um, the next time you are uh, exposed to that that milder stimulus, like the, the door um, opening, you might jump. You might be startled by that by that sound, whereas before you weren't. So that that would be an example of sensitization. Um, and then. Uh, what we call associative learning is where you have um, two or more stimuli that are linked together. So in, in what's called conditioning, especially classical conditioning, uh, you, you start to associate the uh, a stimulus uh, or the response to a given stimulus becomes associated with a different stimulus. Um, now we'll talk about what that means in more detail later on. And then uh, instrumental or operant conditioning uh, involves the association of a given response to a given behavior. So when you when you do something and you get a response, you associate that response with that behavior. Um, you know, uh, typically this is seen in lab animals where you have, say, a rat press a button or press a lever to get a piece of food. Um, after repeated attempts, the rat starts to associate the behavior. In other words, pushing the lever with the, the stimulus. Um, so these are all types of uh, procedural memory that uh, occur in pretty much all animals, as far as we know, um, and can be modeled or, or uh, tested in uh, lots of uh, model organisms. Um, the, the probably best studied uh, animal in terms of uh, memory is this uh, little guy uh, called uh, the aplesia. So this is a type of, of sea slug. So this is what these little guys look like. They're sometimes called sea hares, um, and they they're really common. Um, they they're probably used mostly because they were just easy to collect and to um, to raise in captivity, and so they've just historically been used a lot to study um, not just learning and memory but other um, uh, circuits as well. So. Um, and 
they have a relatively simple body with rel relatively simple nervous systems and they parts of their body are easy to access so this big flap of skin over the top uh, of the back is called the mantle and like what they've done here is you can you can push aside that mantle and you can expose parts of the body like this structure here called the siphon which they use to um, uh, suck water into this mantle cavity where they have their their gill that they use to to breathe and they have a very simple withdrawal reflex associated with this gill so any uh, physical contact with that siphon again normally the siphon would be covered by the mantle so uh, even just gentle uh, uh, contact with that siphon will produce this gill withdrawal reflex where the the gill itself um, kind of retracts inward um, I have actually I have a uh, little video over here stretched out we're going to focus in on, so we're looking at a an aplysia stretched out we're going to focus in on the gill and the siphon we're going to apply an extremely weak stimulus so you can see the amplification with sensitization Weak stimulus to the siphon, you see a modest withdrawal of the gill. Now we're going to frighten the animal, startle it, give a noxious stimulus to the tail. That, of course, causes a contraction in its own right. This contraction lasts for seconds, but you can come back minutes later. The same siphon stimulus now produces a much more powerful withdrawal. We can now compare the two, normal and sensitized, and see how much more powerful the withdrawal is in the animal that is startled. The memory for this event is a function of number of training trials. So that was a video by a guy named Eric Kandel. Um, and actually, I'll send you guys the link to the whole lecture. It's actually really really interesting and, and talks about a lot of the other things we've been talking about in class so um, anyway the uh, the that's why this aplysia is used um, and like in the video you saw you can you can uh, model sensitization but you can also s model um, habituation and conditioning and lots of other types of memory so for example habituation is is probably the simplest form of memory there is and is the easiest to model in, uh, in in pretty much any animal so here um, again all you have to do is sort of repeatedly um, give the same stimulus so so the gill withdrawal reflex uh, is um, triggered by this real simple circuit you have a sensory neuron which uh, is a touch receptor somewhere in the skin of the siphon and that synapses directly onto a uh, a motor neuron that controls the gill muscle. Now, again, these these animals have very simple um, uh, nervous systems, so they only have a, a few neurons that uh, Im comprise the whole thing. So it's relatively easy to map out the nervous system of an animal like this, so much so that uh, each neuron actually has its own name, so they they know exactly which neuron is connected to which uh, muscle, and so on. So uh, in this case, there's a particular sensory neuron that, that detects touch in the skin of the siphon, and that connects directly to this motor neuron, which then controls this muscle. So normally touching the siphon with, um, you know, whatever the, the stimulus would be would trigger that sensory neuron, which in turn would cause it to release neurotransmitter onto the motor neuron, and that causes the muscle to contract. Um, and if you if you apply stimulus repeatedly, so here they're repeatedly stimulating this this sensory neuron by touching it. Actually, in this case, they're uh, stimulating the sensory neuron by electrically stimulating it. Now, this is not the same as applying the the sensitizing electrical shock. This is just a uh, a depolarizing current directly into this neuron. Um, so it's just sort of bypassing the actual contact with the skin, but you could do the same thing by just touching the skin. Uh, the point is that this neuron, the, the sensory neuron, fires an action potential every single time the, uh, the neuron is stimulated or presumably every time the, the skin is touched. Um, but if you record from the motor neuron, the neuron that controls the gill muscle, it's depolarized when the sensory neuron is activated. So um, in each case, um, you have one uh, or simulation of one thing leading to um, activation of the other so so this action potential 
in the presynaptic neuron is leading to a depolarization in the postsynaptic neuron. Um, but over repeated stimulus, stimuli, the the magnitude of this response gets weaker and weaker. So the just the the height of this depolarization gets smaller and smaller and smaller over repeated uh, trials. So again, that's uh, habituation. And the mechanism for habituation is, uh, is pretty simple, um, but it does show that the, the habituation must be occurring in the postsynaptic cell. That's always a question with memory. If, if, if the memory is essentially stored somewhere uh, in the connection between two neurons, the question is, is it being, uh, is the change occurring in the presynaptic cell or the postsynaptic cell? Um, at least in this example, you can see that the presynaptic neuron is is behaving the same every time. So the the uh, magnitude of the action potential is the same on uh, stimulus one as it is on stimulus twenty. So it can't be necessarily that the presynaptic neuron is changing, um, or at least the, the electrical properties of the presynaptic neuron is not changing. So there must be some sort of way to change the response in the postsynaptic cell. And uh, in this case, it's probably due to the fact that the presynaptic neuron just releases less neurotransmitter um, over time with repeated stimuli. Um, now that can be um, you know, a complex mechanism where the, the neuron produces less neurotransmitter or it, um, uh, it, the, the, the genes responsible for making the vesicles are downregulated. But uh, in most cases, it's a very simple mechanism. The, the neuron only has, any neuron only has uh, a certain amount of neurotransmitters stored up at any given time. And if that neuron is activated uh, over and over and over again, um, eventually, if it's if it's releasing neurotransmitter faster than it can make more neurotransmitter, it will gradually release less. And so that's probably what's happening here: is the presynaptic neuron is just running out of neurotransmitter after um, uh, after many repeated stimuli. So so the postsynaptic neuron is seeing a weaker response because the presynaptic neuron is releasing uh, a smaller number of neurotransmitter molecules, and that in turn then causes the gill muscle to uh, contract less because the motor neuron it then is also less active. Um, now sensitization is a little bit more complicated because it requires um, more than two neurons, but it's it's just gone from two to three. Um, so in the case of sensitization, what you have is a, uh, a, a increased response to a weak stimulus, which is caused by uh, a strong or what's called a sensitizing stimulus um, at some other location. So uh, the, in this case, uh, the sensitizing stimulus is a, uh, a strong um, and uh, electrical shock to the head. So in other words, uh, this is not stimulating just one neuron. This is applying electrical current uh, through the skin that's uh, enough to activate uh, whole, uh, various parts of the nervous system, but uh, it would be a, a, a stimulus that would cause the, the gill withdrawal to be stronger than it would to just a normal touch stimulus. Um, and that's detected probably, or, or that shock activates probably multiple neurons within the nervous system. Um, but in particular, it uh, activates uh, these these neurons in the head called L29 neurons. Again, um, the, the neurons in the nervous system of this animal have all been sort of named and numbered. And these neurons, uh, it turns out, uh, synapse with the sensory neurons that detect touch from the siphon. So what's happening is the electrical shock to the head activates this L29 neuron. That L29 neuron then causes something to happen in the sensory neuron such that the next time it's activated by, um, again, even just by light touch to the siphon, it creates an increased response than it did before the sensitizing stimulus. So like you saw in the video, if without the sensitizing stimulus, if you just touch the siphon with a with a pipette tip or a, or a gentle jet of water, uh, you'll get a sort of intermediate uh, amount of gill withdrawal. But then if you apply an electrical shock to the head, that itself causes a large withdrawal of the gill. But then the next time you touch the siphon, even if you don't apply the sensitizing stimulus, you get a greater uh, uh, withdrawal reflex. So that's that's what sensitization means in this context. So what's happening at the synaptic level is that L29 neuron uh, 
releases, uh, it so happens that it releases uh, serotonin. And uh, in this case, serotonin activates a, uh, a G protein coupled receptor. And that G protein coupled receptor activates a, uh, through its G protein, uh, activates an enzyme called adenyl cyclase. And adenyl cyclase um, takes ATP and turns it into this molecule right here called a uh, cyclic AMP. Uh, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, and then cyclic adenosine or cyclic AMP, then in turn activates an enzyme called protein kinase A, um, and a protein kinase is an enzyme, or a type of enzyme that adds phosphate groups to other proteins. And phosphorylating a protein does lots of things to it. It usually causes the shape of the protein to change, and it causes the protein to behave differently. Sometimes uh, it depends on the protein and it depends on the situation, um, but sometimes phosphorylation increases the activity of the protein, sometimes it decreases it. And kinases all have specific proteins that they target. So it doesn't phosphorylate every protein, it just phosphorylates certain proteins. And so these kinases are common um, mechanisms for intracellular signaling. Um, in this case, uh, what happens, protein kinase A, uh, phosphorylates potassium channels in the membrane of the sensory neuron. Um, so normally these potassium channels are just sort of uh, constitutively active, or constitutively open, and if you remember way back to when we talked about um, action potentials, you remember that the, the falling phase of the action potential um, is driven mostly by the influx of potassium into the cell. Uh, but phosphorylated potassium channels in this particular type of cell um, are closed. So uh, the, uh, the effect of protein kinase A is effectively to close some of the potassium channels in the membrane. That reduces the influx of potassium, which um, slows down that falling phase. So it takes longer. So this is, you know, remember, um, this is the rising phase, and this is the falling phase. So when uh, the potassium channels are phosphorylated, there's less potassium current, and so it just takes longer for the membrane to return to rest, um, which means that uh, while there's, uh, uh, while the uh, action potential is active, um, there's more depolarization of this uh, presynaptic cell, and therefore it um, causes uh, more activation of calcium channels, which trigger neurotransmitter release, and there's just more neurotransmitter coming out. Um, and so that it's a uh, simply a, uh, an effect of the this cell down here, the the postsynaptic cell, releasing more neurotransmitter in response to a a given stimulus. But this is um, more of a uh, more complicated and more long-term effect than the habituation mechanism because um, it's releasing more neurotransmitter due to a, uh, a, a covalent change, uh, molecular change at the membrane. So um, that's that's essentially the the memory is is this these phosphorylated potassium channels um, are are causing this neuron to to become more active um, and release more neurotransmitter in response to a uh, a weak stimulus. So. That's an example of how sensitization would work. Uh, also, it's worth pointing out that um, this uh, these mechanisms have been worked out in uh, aplesia, um, and similar mechanisms work in in vertebrates. Which we'll talk about an example um, in a little bit, but um, uh, the this the exact mechanism is not the same in every species, and not even the same in every neuron. Um, it's just that this is an example of how this works in this particular circuit. Now, classical conditioning, meanwhile, um, is yet more, uh, a still more complex type of memory, uh, but it's still able to be modeled in animals, including aplesia. But probably the uh, best known example of classical conditioning is from uh, a guy named Pavlov. He uh, studied dogs and he uh, did this experiment where he would pair uh, a, uh, a stimulus that normally the dog would not have any association with like uh, ringing a bell to one that it would have a response to um, so to the the smell or the flavor of, of meat so what actually he would do is he would uh, take meat that had been dried and powdered 
and then he would apply it through like a tube to the dog's mouth and the dog uh, would salivate. In other words, it would start to drool um, at the, the taste of the meat. Um, and the bell, meanwhile, um, uh, would have no response at all. So the dog, uh, dogs have no natural association uh, 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 with the sound of a bell. And so uh, an, an untrained dog would, would not have any um, response to the bell at all. So we call the, the meat um, the unconditioned stimulus, um, and it's unconditioned. Uh, the word unconditioned in this case just means that the, the dog responds to it uh, naturally. It doesn't require any training to, to salivate in response to meat. Um, and then the, the drooling itself, the uh, increased salivation, we call the unconditioned uh, response. So, so the, the meat is the unconditioned stimulus and the salivating is the unconditioned response. Um, and then the bell we call the conditioned stimulus because again, normally the bell doesn't do anything. The dog does not respond to it. Um, and then conditioning basically just means pairing the two stimuli with each other. So uh, over and over again, and the number of trials this takes depends on on the animal, it depends on uh, what you're trying to pair together. But if you every time the, the dog is presented with the meat, uh, if you ring the bell, um, that's, that's what conditioning uh, implies. And then eventually you can ring the bell without the meat being present and you get what's called the conditioned response um, which in this case is the dog will start to drool uh, in the absence of the meat so just the bell alone is enough to elicit the uh, the conditioned response um, and so that the, the dog has been conditioned essentially to drool to the sound of the bell and of course you can do this with other the the bell itself is is irrelevant you could use any um, anything as the the condition uh, condition stimulus um, that's the whole point it doesn't uh, the, the condition stimulus itself has no particular meaning to the dog um, and you could do other kinds of, of uh, unconditioned stimuli as well so you could um, just in this case this is a you know a positive stimulus but you could also do this with a painful stimulus and so um, you know have the dog be afraid of the sound of the bell or or um, you know associated with uh, 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 pretty much any stimulus you want so um, this is is classical conditioning and uh, again you can model this in any animal including aplesia um, and uh, the way this is done with aplesia is uh, the unconditioned stimulus is the the tail shock. So again, the, the there's no training or conditioning required for the slug to respond to that tail shock. So you apply the electrical current to the tail, and the gill uh, will withdraw. So that is the unconditioned uh, response. And then as a conditioned stimulus, you can apply uh, a weak tactile stimulation to the siphon. So, so just tent, gently touch the siphon with a probe or with water. And the condition stimulus does cause a, uh, a retraction of the gill on its own, but it's it's pretty weak. So, um, so down here you can see that the, uh, the, the unconditioned stimulus by itself um, does, uh, in both cases, in all cases, uh, creates uh, a response. Um, but uh, only if the two are paired. So, um, you know, here uh, we have our condition stimulus, which again is the, the uh, uh, siphon stimulation with the probe, and then the unconditioned stimulus, which is a tail shock. Um, the, un, uh, the unconditioned stimulus by itself produces a sort of moderate uh, withdrawal. Um, and then uh, the, the uh, condition stimulus if it's unpaired with the unconditioned stimulus, which means that you're still presenting both stimuli, but they're not associated with each other. In other words, the timing is such that the uh, conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus don't occur at the same time. You don't get any conditioning. So the the mean withdrawal in response to the, the stimulus is very weak. In fact, weaker than if you apply the uh, unconditioned stimulus by itself. Um, so this is uh, this uh, response to the unconditioned stimulus um, is probably just sensitization. But then pairing them together, meaning uh, applying the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus 
at the same time over repeated trials gives you a much greater response um, and, and this so this is the response to the the just the tactile um, stimulation of the siphon and again as long as they're paired you see a much greater response so now the the uh, the gill is withdrawing here as if it had been shocked even though all you did was just touch it gently with a with a probe so um, again as long as you do that over and over and over again over um, uh, you know this is just one day of training you see a much greater uh, withdrawal um, and eventually it does drop off um, again that's probably uh, an example of habituation but uh, this initial increase is is the conditioning um, so again, what's happening in the uh, in that sensory neuron that's causing it to do this? Again, this L29 neuron, which is the one that's um, uh, activated by the the tail shock, um, releases neur um, releases serotonin. That uh, again causes activation of the cyclic AMP um, uh, pathway, which uh, we just learned before up here. Uh, we said causes sensitization um, and it does in this case too but now uh, or after uh, pairing having both uh, active at the same time you have in addition to cyclic AMP um, or addition to adenylocyclase activity oops, you have uh, acti activation of uh, or increased influx of calcium so uh, pairing the uh, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus leads to increased calcium um, and uh, increased uh, cyclic AMP activity through this G protein. And calcium does a lot of things, but one of the things calcium does is it also um, activates the uh, adenylocyclase pathway. You get more um, potassium channel phosphorylation and increased response to that cell or more neurotransmitter being released from that cell. So, uh, so the unconditioned stimulus by itself um, increases the activity of this neuron by, by increasing cyclic AMP concentration, but the two together, the, the depolarization of the sensory neuron caused by the conditioned stimulus um, leads to calcium influx. Okay, so uh, those two things are what together lead to the even greater uh, concentration of cyclic AMP um, than would be present if you just had the uh, unconditioned stimulus by itself. So again, the idea is that the next time that this neuron is activated, so next time you just apply your conditioned stimulus, a weak tactile stimulation, that cell has an even greater response than it did before. Um, so again, this is how classical conditioning is, is modeled in this particular circuit of this particular animal. Um, and like I said, this is not necessarily how, uh, how this type of memory works in all animals, um, but it has been, it's, it's modeled this way in aplasia just because they have such a simple nervous system. Um, and so we do know a lot about how uh, these mechanisms work in vertebrate uh, brains, uh, mostly by looking at um, uh, rice, uh, mice and rats and um, especially by looking at certain parts of the brain so you can uh, you can show this kind of um, synaptic plasticity anywhere in the brain but the hippocampus is often used to study these kinds of things uh, in part because we know like we said in the last chapter the hippocampus is um, really important for learning and memory itself but also because the hippocampus has um, a, a, a structure that sort of makes it easy to ask these kinds of questions. So this is just a zoomed in view of a rat hippocampus. Um, so remember that the rat hippocamp or the hippocampus is uh, next to this region of cortex called the entorhinal cortex and that, that kind of surrounds the hippocampus um, and it kind of wraps uh, or goes down around the uh, underside of the rat brain. So the hippocampus itself um, in the rat brain kind of wraps around like this so you're kind of seeing it in cross-section um, kind of kind of banana shaped but it's actually two layers of cells that are sort of folded on each other uh, one's called the dentate gyrus and the other one's called Ammon's horn um, spelled Ammon horn um, again it's just 
due to the shape it looks kind of like one of those um, cornucopia horns and uh, in fact then this area Ammon's horn is divided into three sections um, one uh, actually four one two three and four um, but they're called ca because uh, it comes from the latin uh, word for Ammon's horn uh, conus Ammonis, or something like that and in any case um, that's just where the name comes from um, and it turns out that the enterocortex and these two parts of the hippocampus are all connected uh, like so. So you have neurons in the cortex that have axons that connect directly to neurons in the dentate gyrus, which then connect to neurons in uh, what's called uh, area CA3 of hippocampus, um, and then uh, on into CA1. And uh, because they're all laid out uh, in a roughly flat plane like this, uh, it's possible to take a piece of brain from a, a live uh, a rat or mouse and slice it um, uh, in a kind of thick slice. So it's got to be thick enough so that you get uh, uh, a large number of neurons, but um, you know, still only a few millimeters uh, thick. And because their connections are, are organized in this way, each plane um, contains a circuit like this where the synapses uh, stay intact. So you can then take this slice, put it in a, uh, a uh, culture solution that, that's you know, uh, suffused with oxygen so it keeps the tissue alive, and then you can uh, do recording and simulation from individual neurons and actually study individual uh, synapses um, at the level of uh, of a brain slice like this. Um, now, you can also do this in other parts of the brain as well. But uh, again, simply because of the the shape and the, the three dimensional geometry of the circuits in this in the hippocampus, it's especially uh, easy to do um, or relatively easy to do. And so it, it gets used as a model for synaptic plasticity quite a bit. Um, and you can show that um, all the kinds of um, uh, synaptic changes we saw in the in the uh, aplasia happen in the uh, hippocampus also, uh, maybe using different molecular mechanisms, but the overall effect's the same. Um, and one of the most important mechanisms of synaptic plasticity that applies to memory is uh, long-term potentiation. So we talked all about uh, LTP in the last chapter, and we saw that it's really important for development because it helps establish um, or helps establish uh, uh, or, or circuits that are uh, important. Um, for example, in the visual system and for sort of uh, disconnecting unused synapses, but it's also important for memory. So. Um, so LTP can be demonstrated in the hippocampus pretty easily. Um, again, you, you record from a given neuron. So here that we're recording from a neuron in CA1. So, so you have one of these brain slices sitting out. You take a very, very tiny glass pipette and, and apply it uh, to neurons or one neuron somewhere here in CA1. Again, this takes a lot of practice but um, and, and a uh, fancy microscope to do, but you can find individual cells and record membrane potential from those. And then you can stimulate the this neuron by activating one of its inputs. So um, there are multiple uh, neurons within this circuit that, that connect to neurons in CA1. So you can stimulate these neurons by activating um, one of the one of the other structures that connect to it from someplace else. And remember, the way you measure synaptic strength is you apply a, a, a test sim stimulus. So you just apply a small um, uh, single uh, electrical stimulus to one of these inputs, either one, and then you measure the EPSP in CA1. So here we're looking at EPSPs in this CA1 neuron in response to st test stimuli from either uh, neuron 1 uh, input one or input two, and uh, usually this is measured as a percentage of baseline. So um, here uh, they're all at basically a uh, hundred percent, which means that they're they're uh, the response is a hundred percent of the baseline. So by definition, it's at a hundred percent. Um, and then uh, to to produce LTP, you apply a brief high frequency stimulation called a tetanus. Um, so a tetanus is just a, uh, a sustained uh, electrical stimulation of a neuron and it then to in, in this case what they did is they applied the tetanus the high frequency stimulation 
uh, only to the neurons that produce in, uh, input one. And so after the tetanus, then you apply another test stimulus. And uh, what happens here is um, uh, immediately after, there's a very strong uh, increase in the EPSP to that test stimulus. And that uh, lasts for uh, as many as 20 minutes after the, the uh, tetanus stimulus occurs. And hypothetically, you would keep seeing that LTP as long as that neuron is alive. Um, but you don't see LTP in, the, uh, in response to the uh, activation of input 2. So in other words, you, you apply the tetanus to input 1 and then measure the response to a test stimulus on input 2 and there's no change. So that means this is, this is input specific. It's not just that this CA1 neuron, after this tetanus started increasing the strength of all of its synapses, it only can increase the strength of the synapses with input 1. Input 2 uh, inputs didn't change. So this just shows that LTP does occur in vertebrate neurons. Uh, and it is input specific. Um, so uh, uh, there's uh, a lot of evidence to show that this is probably one of the most important mechanisms for storing memories in the brain. Um, by increasing synaptic strength through LTP, um, you have uh, essentially memories being produced. Now, of course, in the, the brain, normally you don't have these uh, intense high uh, frequency uh, stimuli, the, the tetanus stimulation. Um, so instead, the kinds of things that can produce LTP in the brain uh, would just be anything that, that causes sti simultaneously simultaneous activation um, of a neuron by two uh, inputs from, from different, uh, different parts of the brain. Um, and so again, all you need for LTP is for um, uh, strong act activity across a synapse. Um, but especially if you have two different, two or more different inputs to the same postsynaptic cell, um, if those inputs are are active at the same time, meaning they're correlated, then both of them will be increases. Again, this is called um, Hebbian modification, and it is um, uh, an important source of uh, synaptic plasticity. Um, so, for example, let's say um, there are two. Uh, odor stimuli that your uh, brain or your olfactory system is exposed to at the same time. Um, one, or I'm not different, uh, not the same time, but uh, that can be applied at different times. So um, the smell of a rose and the smell of an onion, two completely different chemicals. Uh, presumably somewhere in the brain there would be perhaps in, in hippocampus, perhaps in somewhere in the association part of the cortex, um, there's a neuron that gets input from both parts of the olfactory system that are stimulated by those two um, odors. Now the connections there are weak and so uh, and even though they both are present, um, uh, neither one by itself is sufficient to activate this, um, this third neuron here. But if every time you smell the odor of the rose, you also see a picture of a rose, or you see a rose itself, then the visual image of the rose will activate uh, some part of the visual system. And then that circuit would presumably also have a connection with this neuron. And uh, when the two are presented together, so every time, if every time you smell the rose, you saw the rose, then the connections uh, of those two neurons with this third neuron would get stronger. And so later when you uh, saw or when you smelled the rose, perhaps the image of the rose would pop up in your brain. So again, that's a, a very simple uh, example of a memory and it could be created by this very simple circuit. Now obviously it's not, it requires more than just three neurons, but, uh, but you can imagine a neuron or a set of neurons somewhere in the brain that's activated either by the smell of the rose or by the picture. Um, but either one sort of elicits the memory of the other. Uh, meanwhile, the smell of the onion, even though it's connected to the cell, would not elicit the same response because uh, hopefully every time you see a rose, you don't smell an onion. Um, so, so that connection does not get strengthened and therefore that memory doesn't form. So over here is what you might see if you were recording from from one of these neurons. So uh, again, each time you're, you're uh, pre presenting this neuron with one of these stimuli, it has some sort of baseline, weak baseline stimulus. Uh, 
and uh, and then it's only when two of these stimuli are repeated and paired together, so in this case the smell and the sight, then you get an increase in uh, in the response of that that uh, third neuron, and that uh, then is probably being uh, produced by LTP. So again, that's that is the memory. The next time that this neuron, and so these are all recordings from this this blue cell here, the next time this neuron is stimulated by say the smell of a rose, then it would also activate the same circuit through this cell that is activated by the sight of the rose. So those two those two stimuli become connected, um, literally connected in the brain. Um, so again, obviously this is a, a highly simplistic model of how memory actually works, and of course uh, more complex memories would require a lot more uh, complex mechanism, but um, you can you can kind of imagine or hypothetically how more complex memories could be could be constructed from these uh, these circuits. Um, and again, uh, this all happens by increased synaptic strength, um, which either means an increase in neurotransmitter release or an increase in receptor sensitivity on the postsynaptic side. Now, um, uh, when we were talking about aplesia we showed in, in every case we looked at that uh, it's the presynaptic cell releasing more neurotransmitter that causes the change in synaptic um, strength. And that may occur in some vertebrate synapses also, but uh, in, in other cases we know that it's actually caused by a change on the postsynaptic side. Um, usually an increase in either the activity or the number of amper receptors. So remember the amper receptors are uh, the main glutamate receptor and glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in most parts of the brain. So more amper receptors or more active amper receptors will cause a synapse to become stronger because it will be easier to activate it with a given amount of glutamate. Um, so the thing that causes amper receptors to become more active, um, usually there's there's two things that can happen. Either you just add more receptors, so that's what's happening here, you just take um, receptors that are in the cell, perhaps stored as um, little vesicles, or maybe they actually get uh, uh, made in the nucleus or from uh, the gene for these proteins that get uh, upregulated, and then those get inserted into the membrane um, of the synapse, and that just means more receptors, meaning uh, more places for, for glutamate uh, to bind to. The other way that amper receptors can become more active is through phosphorylation. So some types of amper receptors can be phosphorylated at certain locations on the protein and that makes them um, uh, easier to open or they stay open longer and that lets more sodium in, that lets the, uh, the neuron become uh, more depolarized, that raises this, the uh, magnitude of the EPSP in response to a given glutamate um, release. Um, either way, either through, pho through phosphorylation of the receptors or through increased expression of the receptors, um, you have kinases uh, functioning. So kinases can mediate both of these responses, um, again, either by directly phosphorylating the receptor or by phosphorylating the uh, other proteins that, that trigger the um, upregulation of, of the amper receptor. And those kinases, uh, in turn, some of them, can be triggered by the influx of calcium, which comes in through the NMDA receptors. So our, uh, these NMDA receptors come up again um, as uh, a, an important part of synaptic plasticity because the NMDA receptors, remember, are activated by glutamate, but they also require depolarization of the membrane by uh, uh, in order to release that magnesium block. So remember that these, uh, these receptors always have, uh, or always can have, a magnesium ion that blocks the membrane or blocks the the channel from letting calcium go through um, but depolarization of the membrane will cause that to be released so if this synapse is very highly active in other words um, let's say uh, it was being stimulated by that uh, tetanus type stimulation or if it's being activated by two different stimuli at the same time. So, so again, here, uh, let's go back to our, our rose and onion situation. So uh, if we're looking at a synapse 
um, synapses between the olfactory neurons that detect the smell of the rose and the, the visual neurons that detect the sight of the rose. Um, they are both connected to this uh, uh, postsynaptic cell. And if uh, the sight and the smell are paired together, then both of them will be releasing glutamate. Both of them will be acting AMPA, activating AMPA and NMDA receptor, or releasing glutamate onto both AMPA and, and NMDA receptors. But only if they're activated at the same time will the NMDA receptors actually open because uh, merely releasing glutamate isn't enough. You have to also depolarize the membrane. So uh, both of them uh, depolarizing the cell at the same time will cause NMDA receptor activation, which will cause calcium influx, which will trigger AMPA receptor upregulation, and so on. And so that's the mechanism that hypothetically could increase the strength of those synapses, but not from the onion neuron because uh, the, the neurons that are activated by the smell of the onion would not be active at the same time as the, uh, the neurons that are activated by by the sight or the smell of a rose. Um, but you could hypothetically produce that association if they were paired together. So if you, um, you know, every time you looked at a picture of an onion, someone, uh, or looked at a picture of a rose, someone stuck an onion under your nose um, over and over again, eventually you might start to pair those two together. And so every time you smelled an onion, you might see um, a, a rose in your mind. Um, so anyway, that is the end of that chapter, and that is actually the last chapter we will cover. So again, thank you for listening.